All right, now keep your uh, a bookmark here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. And we're basically going to be picking up where I left off this morning. So this morning, I preached a sermon on the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ and kind of went through the importance that Jesus Christ literally rose from the dead in his body. And essentially what I was doing was we're kind of doing a Bible study, a two-part Bible study today through 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So I was pointing out just that importance through the first half of 1 Corinthians 15 on the bodily resurrection and tying in a lot of other scriptures. And tonight, we're going to go through the rest of 1 Corinthians 15. And you'll notice that the subject matter just shifts a little bit, still about the resurrection. So the first part, we're talking about Christ's resurrection. But then this applies to us because now we're going to be looking more into the resurrection of the saints. So the resurrection of believers, people who put their faith in Christ, we are going to have a resurrection similar to Christ's resurrection that he had. Now, of course, he was begotten of the dead. He, he actually was resurrected up out of hell. We're not going to be going to hell, but nonetheless, um, Jesus Christ's body had a glorified body after he was in the flesh born of the Virgin Mary, his body was changed into a spiritual body, which is why he was able to, as we read earlier, we read about doubting Thomas and it, and it mentioned that when all the disciples were in a room, it said all the doors being shut, then all of a sudden Jesus shows up in the midst and there's differences just physically speaking with a spiritual body. And we're going to get into that as we get into this chapter. The chapter talks a little bit about those differences. Now, I don't know what all the differences are, but they're different. Okay. Nonetheless, it is definitely a different type of body, but we'll get into that. So let's get started here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And as, like I said, keep a bookmarker in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 because we're going to be there in just a minute. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're going to start reading in verse number 20. The Bible says, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. So this is important. We're going to get to this order in just a minute, but Jesus Christ being that first one to experience a resurrection. He's, he's called, basically that resurrection is the first fruits of them that slept. Slept is, is a term given to those people who have died, but they've died. It's, it's usually talking about people who have died that have eternal life. So it's just a physical death. The Bible refers to those people as being asleep, like because it's referring to their bodies, right? It's not referring to their soul. We don't believe in this soul sleep where like you're just unconscious until the resurrection. We believe that once you breathe your last breath, however that happens, your body remains here on earth, but then your soul and your spirit depart from your body. And if you're saved, you go on to be in heaven with the Lord. And then at the resurrection, you're going to be reunited with your body. As your body is, is resurrected up out of the ground, you're going to have a soul and spirit then just back in with your body and um, then you'll have that new glorified body, new resurrected body and be in that state uh, for the rest of eternity. So we're going to, again, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, so let's, let's keep reading this passage here. Verse number 21, for since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Now, this is just showing that great balance that God has, that, that he's saying, you know, because by man, through Adam, by man, sin entered into the world, well, God's offset to that, God's way to, to counter that sin was to have a man in the form of Jesus Christ, that man then to, to balance that out, to bring the resurrection of the dead, to save those that die because of their sins. So he comes to be the resurrection of the dead. And then it's, uh, you know, as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Verse 23, but every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. And then we're going to get on to the third resurrection in just a minute. We're going to continue on, but we're going to stop right here. This is important scripture. You know, I just went over... I think it was last week, let no man, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 
and we went over a lot of just end times, you know, real basic passages you can turn to to talk about the timing of the rapture. Well, when you see resurrection in this passage, that's talking about the rapture. It's just another word for it. It's, it's, it's going to be the resurrection happens. At this, the, the first resurrection is when the rapture happens. It's a, it's a synonymous event. So um, it's giving us the order here. For the first, which isn't a full resurrection because it was only one person. It was just Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is known as the first fruits. Right? He's just that, that initial resurrection. And then next, so that already happened. Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. Amen. That's what we're celebrating today. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He's the first fruits. After that, they that are Christ's at his coming. And that's why we started here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So flip over there real quick. The second coming of Christ, because he already came once. He came once, died on the cross, rose again from the dead, ascended up into heaven. When he comes back, that is going to be the next resurrection or the first resurrection. Look at verse number 13. We're going to see this again, just the, the coming of Jesus Christ and that, that same terminology being used. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4.13, the Bible reads, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. And notice it's the same terminology here. In 1 Corinthians 15, it's talking about them that slept. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is, again, referring to people who are asleep. They're asleep in Christ. They're, they're, they're dead because their body's dead. Verse number 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord, and now there, there's a phrase, the coming of the Lord, which is also referenced in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, shall not prevent them which are asleep. And what this is just basically saying is that, you know, whoever is still alive and remains, any believers at the coming, when Jesus Christ comes back, the people who are caught up to be with the Lord in the air because they're still alive and remain, they're not going to prevent or come before the people who have already died and are asleep in Christ, right? So let's say, let's say the rapture is going to happen next week, right? Just as an example. And I die tomorrow, physically, right? My body is going to be buried, whatever, and my, my soul is going to go up to heaven. And then next week, the rapture happens, and you all are still alive. What he's saying is that you're not going to get to go up before I do. You're not going to prevent those that are asleep in Christ because basically at that resurrection, it's going to happen basically at the same time. And people who are asleep in Christ, the dead bodies, they're going to rise up. And my soul, my spirit is going to come be reunited. And the people who are alive remain because your body's not buried. You're just going to be, you're going to be caught up and changed where your body's changed also. So um, that's what happens here. And that's what 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is telling us. And these are words of comfort, which we'll see in, another, in, in just a few verses. Because... We don't have to worry about people who have died that were saved. Because at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, they're going to be resurrected. You're going to get to see them again. Their body's going to be resurrected, and you'll be with them then at that moment. So um, verse number 16, the Bible says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, I don't know anybody who doesn't say that this is the rapture. I mean, this is a real common passage just re re referring to the rapture, but when you compare it to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it's clear this is that first resurrection. This is what the Bible is talking about because there are people literally coming up out of the graves. Those that are asleep in Christ are coming up. And then those who are alive and remain also get taken up and are raptured up at the same time. Um, 
Flip over to Revelation chapter 20 real quick. Revelation chapter 20, we're going to see the same event being referenced. And then being uh, referred as the first resurrection. So in Revelation chapter 20, verse number 4, the Bible reads, And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Now, I don't have time to completely flesh all of this stuff out and, and provide all of the support, but essentially the way that the timeline works is that when Christ comes back, that is the, the rapture, that is that first resurrection. And those that are asleep, like we just saw, they're going to rise up, we're going to be transfigured, and then Christ is going to end up setting up his throne here on earth for a thousand years. So at the point of the rapture, God's going to pour out his wrath on the earth for a few years, and then Jesus Christ is going to establish his throne and set up his kingdom. And there are going to be people here. Now, first of all, that at that first resurrection, God's not going to be raising up everybody who's ever died. That first resurrection is, is a resurrection of believers only, people who were in Christ when they died. There is going to be a resurrection for everybody. But at this resurrection, it's only those who have, who have been in Christ, who are saved. The rest of the dead live not again. And that's what this is saying here. The rest of the dead in verse number five of Revelation 20. The rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. That's why verse six says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Amen. So, those people who are saved, the second death has no power in them. So everybody who's saved is going to be resurrected at that first resurrection. And that's a blessing to be part of that. Because people who aren't part of that first resurrection, their soul's already burning in hell. Or they're still alive on this earth, you know, and, and if they've taken the mark of the beast or whatever, uh, will ultimately end, still stand before God on judgment day. And we'll see that second resurrection um, that second resurrection in a minute. Stay in Revelation 20, in 1 Corinthians 15. So we already read, every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. That's the first resurrection. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. So the end that's being referred to in 1 Corinthians 15, 24, is when Jesus has already now reigned for that thousand years. So you had that first resurrection, Jesus' kingdom set up, he reigns for a thousand years. And now, after that thousand years has finished, and after this, you know, Satan's loosed out of, out of the hell, and he has one last final attempt to, to fight against God and to deceive the nations that are still around on the earth at the end of that thousand years, he gathers this whole army against them and, and just they get consumed in a moment. It's not even a fight. And this is the point now where you have that second resurrection. And it says um, in Revelation 20, verse 7, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of, the pr out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. So they come to, to surround the city, to surround Jerusalem, and they're ready to, to fight. And God just goes and just sends fire from heaven down and just, just destroys them all. It's not even a fight. It says in verse 10, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. 
And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man, according to their works. This is the second resurrection. This is the resurrection where people who have died and gone to hell, that's why it says death and hell, deliver up the dead that are in them. And notice, you cannot pass over this. This is all referring to people who are dead. The Bible refers to people who have eternal life as alive. The Bible says God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. When it's talk about Isaac and, and, and uh, Jacob and Abraham. Right? When it's talking about these, these forefathers that were saved, that were believers, Jesus refers to them as being alive. He says, yeah, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. How could he rejoice if he's just asleep in the ground? He wasn't just asleep in the ground. He was alive. He was in heaven. He saw Jesus Christ's birth. And he was happy for it. He didn't see it from hell. He didn't see it from Hades. He didn't see it from, you know, the, the good part of hell. He saw it from heaven. And um, he was able to see Jesus Christ's day. And he's going to be part of the first resurrection. Abraham. All of the Old Testament believers. But at the second resurrection, this is where all the, rest, all the dead now are, are being delivered up. And they're going to stand before God and be judged. See, at the first resurrection, we're going home to be with the Lord. He's not going to sit there and judge us. We'll have the judgment seat of Christ where God gives out rewards. That's a good place to be, right? At the first resurrection, there's going to be a judgment seat of Christ where he's going to weigh out what you've done in this earth because you got into heaven for free. Now he's going to say, okay, well, let's see what you did with your life. And he's going to try your works by fire and anything that, that, is, that is actually good and, and abides the fire and remains, you're going to get rewarded for that. He's going to say, well done. And you're going to rule and reign with Christ and, and it's going to be great. But at the second resurrection, when the, rest, when the dead are, are brought back to stand before God, People, you know, souls that have been in hell for however long they've been in hell, you know, their bodies are coming up. That's why it says the sea delivered up the dead that were in them just from all over the place. They are going to be resurrected. And the Bible talks about woe unto him who, uh, you know, it says fear not him that, um, fear not what man can do unto you. It says, but, you know, fear, fear him that hath power to destroy both soul and body in hell. Because right now when people die, their souls go to hell, their body doesn't. But after the second resurrection, they will be reunited with their body also, and they'll be cast into the lake of fire, which ultimately is where hell is also relocated to. So they're just going back to hell. It's just now in the lake of fire instead of in the center of the earth. So there's no problem with saying, you know, you go to hell forever because basically you do. You, Everyone in hell right now is going to have one chance of, or one uh, moment when they're out of hell. And that's when they're standing before that great white throne and they're going to have the books open and be judged according to their works. So if they didn't figure it out already, they're going to hear exactly why their soul is in hell. And for all the people that rejected the free gift of salvation and for what, however they decided to word it, were trusting in themselves, they're going to be judged in, according to what they believed. And, and it, they're, going to be they're going to come up lacking and wanting. And they're going to be cast into that lake of fire. And that, that is the second Resurrection, and that's why. Hey, anyone who took part of the first resurrection, that second, that second death, that second re resurrection, second death has no power on you because you're not going to end up there. It's the people who were already dead uh, that were not believers that get thrown in the lake of fire. Now, um, let's 
kind of going back and forth here. If you still have your, your finger in 1 Corinthians 15, look at verse number 25. We're going to go back one more time to Revelation. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 25 says, For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So the, the reason why I'm going back and forth is I'm trying to show you how everything fits in with these other chapters, right? 1 Thessalonians 4, we saw how that fits in with 1 Corinthians 15, talking about them that sleep and talking about, you know, um, um, going up into heaven at the, at the trump of God and, uh, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Tying that in with the first resurrection and Revelation 20, we see the first resurrection and then the thousand years and then the second resurrection. And following in order here with 1 Corinthians 15, it says, The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And in Revelation 20, verse 14, the Bible says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So it's not just hell being relocated. It says death and hell. Death is being destroyed, essentially, at this point. There's no more death. That is the last enemy. And this is last. Because right before this, Satan is cast into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet already are. And all of the unbelievers were cast into the lake of fire. The only thing left, it says, in death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. That's the last enemy to be destroyed. Then the new heaven and new earth is formed. And in Revelation 21, verse 4, the Bible says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death. Neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Just, just cementing, death's been destroyed. There is no more death. It's over. It's done. This lines up perfectly in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 26, saying the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. There's so many ways to understand the end times events when you put them side by side, and you can see, yeah, this fits. We don't have to juggle things around we can read them in order in the context and it lines up with the order in other passages. This is why the, the pre-trib, post-wrath, or excuse me, post-trib, pre-wrath, got that backwards, is correct, is right, because you don't have to do any manipulations to the Word of God in order for it to fit. It just fits no matter how you slice it, well, not, not how you slice it, but when you just go in order, <laughs> no matter what passage you're looking at, whether you're looking at 1 Thessalonians 4, Matthew 24, Mark 13, you know, any chapter in Revelation, no matter what you're looking at, it all just fits reading it straight down, reading it in context. Oh, yep, yep, this all lines up. 1 Corinthians 15, yep, we're talking about resurrections here, and we're just going to keep going down in order, and it lines up with everything that these other books are saying. So back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's look at verse number 27. Because this is really our, our main source text that we're, that we're studying through tonight. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, that's easy to teach on. That's already happened. And we've got lots of, of places to source that from and look to. But this, this, the first resurrection, as it's called, the resurrection of the saints, you know, people believe a lot of different things, and this is a little bit harder to teach on, although there is still just an abundance of Scripture here as well. And we're going to try to line them all up here, because 1 Corinthians 15 talks a lot about this. Look at verse number 27. For he hath put all things under his feet, but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. So basically that's just saying, when the Bible's saying that all things are put under Jesus Christ, it's not referring to the Father, right? The, 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 the Father which, which did put all things under him. He's saying everything's put under Christ. Um, that's the only exception. It says, verse 28, And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. And he's saying then when, when everything's done, when it's said and done, after that thousand years, and he's handing power back over, because what happens is the father gives the son power. He's ruling and reigning, and he's, in, he's the boss. He's in charge. 
He's at the top of the, of the power structure. And then when he's done with all of that, he delivers that power back over to the Father and says, okay, now I'm going to submit myself back to the, the authority of the Father. And it says, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? If the dead not rise not at all, why, then, why are they then baptized for the dead? Now I want to deal with this verse because I think this is, is pretty straightforward and simple. I've heard different people's uh, explanations or understanding of what this verse is even talking about. But when you consider the entire passage is about the resurrection, and now it's talking about baptism, baptism is a picture of the resurrection. I mean, it ties in perfectly when we get baptized, and we're going to look at Romans chapter 6. If you want to turn there, go ahead. Keep your place in 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to look at Romans chapter 6. Romans 6 gives this, this full picture of being baptized with Christ. We're being baptized into his death. We're being raised again. I mean, this ties in 100% with, um, with the resurrection. I don't think that this is just all of a sudden bringing up some random doctrine that people have had of baptizing people for the dead like the Mormons do. Like the Mormons in their church, they do these baptisms for people who've already died. And they're like, oh, we're going to baptize this person. We're going to baptize that, you know, and like someone kind of stands in and just keeps getting dunked or whatever. They have different people come in. They just get dunked over and over again for like other people who have died already to try to help out, They're kind of like a purgatory type of thing or whatever, just to help these people out in the afterlife and, and make things better for them, right? That they do these weird baptisms for the dead. But I don't think that that's what this is even referring to. I think this is just basically saying, um, if the dead don't rise, because earlier in the chapter, we, we already covered this, but if there is no resurrection, then what would even be the point of baptizing people? is basically what he's saying. I mean, why would we even do it? If there is no resurrection at all, then why would we even baptize people for someone who's dead, right? Like, we're baptizing people in the name of Jesus. Well, if Jesus is just dead and there's no resurrection, then what's the point of baptizing people at all for, for some guy that died? And if there's no resurrection, like you said before, you, you know, then, then you're still in your sins, you, you know, there's, <laughs> there is no salvation if there's no resurrection. And Romans 6 just really, really ties this together. Look at verse number 2. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. So, and then it goes on and on. And it's just basically demonstrating there that in baptism, we're buried with Christ, and just like he rose again, we should walk in newness of life, and, and just brings that correlation together. And in 1 Corinthians 15, it's basically just saying, well, then why would we even baptize people for the dead? Why are we going out and baptizing? If the dead don't rise, then this doesn't even, baptism doesn't even make any sense. So that, that's the way I understand it. I think it's pretty straightforward um, to, to see all that in Scripture. But let's keep reading here in uh, 1 Corinthians 15. Verse number 30, And why stand we in jeopardy every hour? I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantageth it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. And again, this is the same attitude. We saw this a little bit earlier. I went over this this morning of saying, you know, we're of all men most miserable. If there's, if there's no resurrection from the dead, then what are we doing here? He's like, then why have I been fighting beasts at Ephesus? I mean, what advantage is there to any of that stuff, to living this type of a life that's just, you know, dangerous, people hate me. If the dead aren't going to rise, then hey, let, we might as well just eat and drink and be merry and just enjoy ourselves as much as we possibly can for tomorrow we die. Because what's the point of living 
if there's no resurrection? What's the point? We, we might as well just do whatever we possibly could to, to enjoy ourselves and make our flesh feel good if there's no resurrection. And you know what? That's a philosophy a lot of people have. That's a mindset people have. They say, well, I'm going to die. There's going to be nothing else after this, so I might as well just do what I can, do whatever feels good. I think it's great, though, that God... God lets us know that that's not the right way because everybody who lives that lifestyle, it's not fulfilling. It's not that great even. I mean, you think about what you can do to satisfy or to gratify your flesh. Drinking, drugs, fornication, adultery, whatever. I mean, all these things that could be appealing to the flesh. It's never what it's cracked up to be. In fact, it will... I would say always just bring more hurt, more sorrow, more pain than any pleasure that it might bring you at all. These are just, God has inherent consequences with sin. There, there's just, it's just, you know, the drugs have a toll on your body. The alcohol has a toll on your body. It's going to destroy you. Whereas if you don't go down that sinful path, it's not going to be nearly as bad for you. It's better for you. And these things are just, are just, part of life and I think the fact that that is a part of our life should point people in the direction of maybe there's more to life and there is really an afterlife and that there's you know we don't we, we shouldn't just have this this mindset of let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die the Bible says in verse 33 be not deceived Evil communications corrupt good manners. Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. And I love this verse right here because he's basically telling the, the Corinthians here, you know, awake to righteousness, sin not. And then he says, some people don't have the knowledge of God. Shame on you. Shame on the believers when some people don't have the knowledge of God. Now, not everyone is going to receive Christ. Not everyone is going to receive God. But if they don't even have the knowledge of God, then shame on you. We ought to make sure that everybody has that knowledge, that they have the choice. You can't force anyone to believe, but shame on us if, if there's people around us, if there's family, friends, anybody really in our vicinity that doesn't have the knowledge of God. We need to make sure they get the knowledge of God. And that's a shame on us if, if, if that's the case for anyone who, who doesn't have that knowledge. And that's why I said, I speak this to your shame. It's a shame. We ought to be ashamed of ourselves because we need to go out there and, and warn these people and let them know that there is a God, that we have a, a, a living God that has risen again from the dead. Verse number 35. But some man will say, how are the dead raised up and with what body do they come? Thou fool. That which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bear grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. So now, he's answering an objection here. He says, well, then how are the dead, dead raised up? What body are they going to have? Meaning that when you bury a body in the ground, it decomposes, right? So you say, well, well, then how can they even have a body, right? I know there's only bones in the ground now. There's only skeletons, and even those will, will become brittle and turn to dust. So then what kind of body can it have? And he says, you fool. Don't you understand how it works? I mean, don't you understand how just basic life works? And he brings up just a seed, right? When you, when you plant a seed in the ground, what comes up looks nothing, you know, it's, it doesn't look like that seed anymore. That seed dies, but then brings forth new life. And what comes up is that new life. And it's, uh, he says here, this is a body that, that hath pleased him. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him to every seed his own body. When we die and get buried in the ground, this is why I believe that, one of the reasons why I believe that burial is the Christian thing to do when somebody dies is because it's a representation of the resurrection. It's something that, that you're symbolizing. 
a body being buried in the ground, just like a seed is buried in the ground that brings forth that new life over time. So in time, when Jesus Christ comes back, our body is going to come back up out of the grave as a new life, as a new creature in a way, because our, our body is going to be changed and glorified. And it, it's, there's a lot of symbolism involved in the sowing of our bodies into the ground. And, I mean, you see that throughout Scripture from Abraham going on and, and the importance of that burial. And unfortunately today, and especially like in our country, um, burials have gotten really expensive. And, I, and I, was, I was just dealing with this before I left Prescott Valley with a, with a lady in a, in, a, in a rest home there that I was, I was visiting. And she was trying to get things in order for herself because she didn't know when she was going to die, but she didn't have any family and she was just kind of left at this place. And it's expensive. And the cheaper route is to go with cremation. Now, if somebody gets cremated and they're saved, well, obviously they're still going to, God's still capable of resurrecting them and those ashes and that dust is going to be able to come back. Okay? And if someone's already dead, whatever someone else chooses to do with their body, like, like that person's not responsible for that, right? I mean, if someone else just does something with your body, whatever. But I do think, it, you know, the right thing to do is, is to, to plan for having a burial. It's not that God's not powerful to, to overcome that, but just all of the symbolism involved with that and being sown into the ground and, you know, what we're seeing here with the, with the, with the resurrection, it, it's, these things are important. I mean, the symbolism's important. Baptism's important. Yeah, it's a command of God, but it's also showing something. God teaches people and, and kind of humans in general, the mankind, in ways using things like tradition, using these types of real basic um, traditions to, to help people un have, get a better understanding of stuff. You know, for, that's why for the longest time in the Old Testament, they just had these rituals of, of sacrifices. And it was just hammering home some basic truths. We have traditions in weddings that have a lot of symbolism, a lot of meaning to it. We have traditions in burying our dead, which carries a lot of meaning to it. And, you know, people should be asking the question, why do, you know, children especially, why do we bury them? Why do you put their body in the ground? Well, this is why. Because as Jesus Christ died and was buried, he rose again from the grave. That brings new life. Just as you plant a seed, that brings forth new life. That's why we bury people in the ground. So it's, a, you know, it's just another opportunity to, to share that great truth. But let's keep reading here in 1 Corinthians 15. Verse number 39, All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. And this, again, this, this, I would say this is just common sense. The flesh that we have as humans is not the same as a bird, right? When you eat steak, it tastes different than when you eat chicken. There's a different flesh of beasts. There's a different flesh of birds. There's a different flesh of fish, right? Not everyone likes eating fish, but everyone likes chicken, right? <laughs> so everything tastes like chicken. No, there's, there's different types of meat. And, and God created his creatures, his creation differently. And there's different types of flesh. And using this understanding, just what we can naturally see here, he's going to relate that to celestial bodies in the next verse, verse 40. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. So celestial would be like heavenly, terrestrial is earthly. There's heavenly bodies, there's earthly bodies, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. They're different. They're not exactly the same. One's more glorious than another. Verse 41, there is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars for one star differeth from another star in glory. And that word glory is literally referring to just like the brightness, right? The shining. So the sun has a great glory, right? In the sky, just physically the, the sun that exists. That has a lot of brightness to it. That has a great brightness. The moon... The glory that you see, the light that shines that we see at night from the moon is much less, right? It's a, it's a much less glorious light. And the stars are even, even smaller than that. 
because they're, they're giving off, you know, it's less light that we perceive there. And the glory is different. He says, so also he's using, again, this, this real world example of things that we can see to uh, associate that with this other concept of the resurrection of the dead. Verse 42, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. This is starting to get exciting when we're thinking about our resurrected bodies. We're sown in corruption. We have a sinful flesh, right, that drives us to sin. That's corrupt, but when it's raised, it's going to be raised in incorruption. It's sown in dishonor. The sins that we've committed is very dishonorable, but it's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness, but raised in power. It's sown a natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there's a spiritual body. And just very clear to make the distinction. We are going to be at the resurrection, at the first resurrection. When Jesus Christ comes back, we're resurrected. Our body is going to be changed from the physical body, the natural body, into a spiritual body. And the spiritual body is going to be way better than our natural body. We're going to be raised in power. We're going to be raised in glory. We're going to be raised in incorruption. We're going to be raised a spiritual body. That's a lot to look forward to. And as we saw in Revelation also, you know, God's going to wipe tears from eyes and there's going to be no more sorrow. There's going to be no more pain. We're not going to be experiencing the things that you experience physically in this life right now. That's something to look forward to because there's no more sin. See, sin brought death into the world. God made everything great. God made everything perfect. God made everything right. Man, sin brought the curse on himself. We're going to get to see the way that God intended it from the beginning until man screwed it up and be able to experience no more, oh man, waking up, oh, aches and pains and problems and yeah, I, I'm going to see more of the people who are getting older are going to be nodding their heads a lot more vehemently. Yep, I know exactly what you're talking about. I'm, I'm getting there Every year, I'm starting to find more and more places. I'm like, what is that? Well, why is that hurting? I didn't even know I had a muscle there. So, you know, what is that? I don't know. It's weird. Never had this problem before. But we won't have to worry about those types of problems when we are resurrected in, in our spiritual body. Let's keep reading verse number 45. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. So now we're comparing, you know, again, there's, there's so much symbolism here. Between Adam, the first man, the first man formed out of the earth, he is earthy. God created man out of the dust of the earth and breathed the breath of life into him. The second Adam, or the second man, is referring to Jesus Christ as the Lord from heaven. He is a quickening spirit. And um, the first that came was Adam. The first is fleshly. Well, the first with us is our physical birth. We are physically born, but then the second birth, that second man, the new man, is that spiritual birth that we have um, and in this case, between Adam and Jesus Christ, the first man is earthy, the second man is the Lord from heaven. Verse 48, as is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy, and as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, so we bear the image of Adam, because he is our ancestor going all the way back through history. Adam and Eve are the progenitors of every human being on the earth. You just keep going back. We all have that common ancestor. And it says, as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. So because you're born again, because you're born of Christ, you have Christ in you, at that resurrection, when we get that new spiritual body, we're going to be formed and fashioned after Christ. And instead of having the, the resemblance of, of Adam in our physical bodies, now we're going to have, we're going to be truly the image of Christ. 
in our glorified body. And it says here in verse 50, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. We are corrupt. We have these physical bodies, our flesh, our blood. We can't make it to heaven in this state that we're in right now. Not allowed. Corruption doesn't inherit incorrupt. In heaven, it, it's incorrupt. It's perfect. He's not going to allow this corruption there, which is why we need to be changed. It says in verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. And again, sleep is referring to physically dying. Not everybody is going to physically die because those who are still alive at the coming of Jesus Christ, they're not going to die. But they'll be changed. And the Bible says here in verse 52, the famous passage, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. So those who are dead in Christ, those who are asleep, they're going to be raised incorruptible. They're going to be raised with that spiritual body. And those who are alive and remain, they're going to be changed. Their body is just going to be transformed in an instant. I mean, you're not even going to see it. It's just going to be like, boom. One second, you're, you're in your natural body, and then you are transformed, transfigured into this new spiritual body. And it's just going to happen that fast. And notice it says here, at the last trump. The last trump throws people off when you're trying to figure out sometimes you know, the timing of this resurrection, this first resurrection. It shouldn't. A trump is the sound a trumpet makes at the last trump. Now, you can see this throughout Scripture. There's many times where a trump or a trumpet can be referred to as the last one. But just because it says the last, it doesn't mean the last one like ever of just all in, in, the, in, the, in the whole time span of eternity. This is the last trumpet sound that will ever sound. That's not what it's talking about. That would be kind of silly to think that it is. But you, you do have to put some type of meaning to this. Okay, when it's talking about the last, when is that? When is the last? Is it which secession is this talking about? Right. Last is literally just, just in some sequence. Okay, at, and within this time frame, within this sequence, this is the last one. You can't just automatically say, well, this is talking about the seven trumpets when God's pouring out his wrath and then this is just at the last. That's what people who believe in the, you know, what, what you might refer to as a more commonly known as a post-tribulation rapture view, which uh, we're post-trib, but we're pre-wrath. The other people that call themselves post-trib, they're the ones that believe in just a seven-year tribulation period and they believe it's at the end of those seven years that this rapture takes place. And this is one of the reasons that they get confused is they see, oh, well, this is at the last trump and that last trump happens at the very end of, of God's wrath. So that's when we're changed and that's when Christ, you know. But that doesn't fit at all with the rest of Scripture. What makes sense, though, if you compare this with Matthew chapter 24, you're going to see a trumpet sound in Matthew 24 at the rapture, at the, you know, when I say the rapture, at the timing that lines up with everything else that I've taught on this. What I was teaching last week, what I'm teaching tonight, matches up still perfectly. The last trump, so at the last sound that this trumpet makes, that's the moment, that's the twinkling of the eye when, uh, when the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Matthew 24, verse 29 says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And when you look up this event in Revelation and in other places, you're going to see that this is the beginning of God pouring out his wrath. Like that doesn't, God's wrath doesn't happen until after this event. Matthew 24, immediately after the tribulation, when this thing happens, it says, Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, 
And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from the one end of heaven to the other. So we have this sound of a trumpet. And without this having to go into detail, I mean, if you're just to, to use, again, common sense, any time you hear trumpet sounds, it's most likely not just going to be, there's probably going to be a little bit something more to that, right? Not just your most basic monotone sound that a trumpet can possibly make. Like if I tried to play a trumpet, I wouldn't be very good at it. I'd probably be able to make one noise or one tone. Normally, when trumpets are sounded, whether it be for war, for, for any purpose, right? Because there's a purpose for the sound of this trumpet. It's not just some random noise, right? And even 1 Corinthians 13 talks about everything that makes sound, there's a purpose for it. And, and you, know, you need to understand what is the purpose of sound. The angels need to understand you know, they're, they're making this sound because they're sounding this call to action to reap. So when you hear like a charge da, 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 and you have a, 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 a sound or sounds that are made, and it's probably going to be more than just one trumpet. It's the sound of a trumpet, but it's going to be trumpets being sounded. And then when the sound ends at the last trump, the last noise that's made when the trumpet's sounding, that's when the, the bodies change. Not that, you know, this isn't some, you don't have to be twisting things around. You just read it very plainly and very simply. Hey, this, this matches up perfectly. There's, there's no reason to cut and paste things out of order. Again, it just matches up. Everything that we continue to read, it matches up. So when it says the last trump there, you don't have to ascribe that to the seventh trumpet in, the, in, in Revelation. There's, there's no, you don't have to. It's not what it's, it's, not what it's saying. This is the trumpet that sounds when the dead are raised. The dead are raised in Matthew 24 when the angels are called and they reap and they gather together the elect. Makes sense. Let's keep reading in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 53. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. This, um, this saying when it says that shall be brought to pass comes from Isaiah 25, 8. I'll just read this for you. It says, he will swallow up death in victory and the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth for the Lord has spoken it. And isn't that interesting? The rebuke of all of his people shall he take away from off all the earth. The rebuke of his people. Because what's happening at this point? The tribulation, the great tribulation, the great persecution, the great rebuke of the people of God being sought after, being martyred. So that's going to stop. That stops when he comes back. That stops when he swallows up death and victory. Hey, what a victory that's going to be. What a day when we see Jesus Christ. If we happen to be alive and remain to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. What joy. What a great event that's going to be. Wow, we made it. You've been, you've been persecuted and un going, undergoing great tribulation. What a relief to see Christ coming and ending that rebuke, ending that persecution and swallowing up all that death in victory. Because now you could say, there's the Savior. Watch out, all you wicked people that took the mark of the beast that's out to kill me, that's out to kill you. He's here. He's here to judge. And we could rest completely. I mean, obviously we rest in him now, but that death is swallowed up in victory. God's going to wipe all tears from off all faces keep reading here in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 55. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? 
The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And what a great victory that is. Victory over our sins. Victory over death and hell. Jesus has conquered it for us. And he gives us that victory for free. We put our trust in him. That sting, we don't have to feel that sting of death. It's not going to hurt us. It's not going to hurt us because Jesus felt that sting for you. He took that sting. He conquered that sting. And he gives us the victory. Verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And he's covered a lot of things previously. You know, talking about how... Um, Make sure my stuff got out of order here, but I think this is the last page. He's referenced multiple times. Well, if Christ isn't, isn't risen, then, our, then uh, you know, our faith is in vain. We might as well just eat, drink, be merry, you know, all this other stuff. And at the end of the chapter, he's basically saying, therefore, he says, you know, be steadfast, be unmovable. Don't be shaken. Continue in the fight. Keep moving forward. Always abound in the work of the Lord. Just keep doing more and more and more because we know, we know that our labor is not in vain in the Lord. We know that he conquered death and hell. We know that the resurrection is true. Nobody can tell us otherwise. We know this, so we need to keep on pushing forward. We need to keep on working, knowing that because Christ was raised from the dead, because we know that that's true, we know that eventually we will also experience a resurrection. And just as he was raised up in his spiritual body, we're going to be raised again in, in a spiritual body as well. And that's something we have to look forward to. So don't let the naysayers, people who want to say there is no resurrection, there is no Christ, you know, these people can't get us down. We know the truth. The truth has already made us free. We need to just go out and, and not be ashamed like the other people that don't, because the people around them don't know God. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the resurrection, and we thank you for, even after saving our souls, which is just incredible in itself, but you've also decided to give us new bodies and give us spiritual bodies, Lord, that, um, that are going to be raised in power and raised in corruptible it's hard to even imagine what that must be like because we're stuck in this sinful flesh. God, I thank you for completely saving us from our sin and that ultimately one day we'll be able to just be able to walk in incorruptible bodies without the, without the, the lusts of the flesh trying to, to pull us away from serving you. God, help us to be strengthened in our spirit. Help us to do the work that's laid out before us. Lord, help us to be encouraged and encourage one another to continue in our labors and to continue in our fight because we know that it's not in vain. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.